Hello, and welcome to my new program. My name is Jeff Basildon, and this program is called Art Weekly. And every week, it is my intention for us to discuss, or rather for me to discuss and for you to listen, ah, to my stories about art history. In this very first episode, I believe it would be very useful for all of us to look at a movement called Impressionism. They were known as the Impressionists, funnily enough. Um, they didn't do impersonations. <laughs> Let's get that straight. Yeah, they were artists. Yeah, Impressionist artists. And we're going to discuss what that means. Let's start by looking at one of the pieces of work by the man who was there at the beginning of Impressionism, although he himself did not consider himself to be an Impressionist. No, <laughs> he thought he was a realist, and in many ways he was. But his reality was not there, that everyone else would have in their lives, which is why we must look, also in this programme, at the rise of Paris as a city. Hmm. Paris. Paris. Ah. 19th century, Paris was a changing city. It was growing, expanding, at an increasing rate. More people wanted to live there. It was a city, it was bustling, it was full of finance, energy, lots and lots of industry. Times were changing, things were changing, people were changing. The country was moving slightly away from, say, uh, agriculture as being a main means of uh, finance, although it did supply a great deal of funds to the government, but the city was growing in. A man named Napoleon III decided he wanted to make Paris the standout city in Europe, so he employed a man called Baron Haussmann to redesign the city of Paris. Napoleon, being a military man, of course, wanted to ensure that he could protect the city, and uh, he asked Haussmann to make sure that you could march an army down the streets of Paris to protect the people of Paris, indeed. So that's what he did. He made broad, bold streets Boulevards, they became known as Le Boulevard, Le Boulevard. Yeah, so these boulevards were designed to be able to march an army down, but they also prevented things like uh, fires spreading. Of course, the uh, terrible fire that destroyed a large part of London uh, a couple of centuries prior to the 19th century, the Great Fire of London, as it is in fact known, was another reason why slums had to go. They just had to go. They just weren't safe. The spread of fire could wipe out a city, and you couldn't have that, no, not at all. So these beautiful big boulevards were designed, and uh, people were moving into the city. Young bankers, lawyers, doctors, you name it, people with money. The bourgeois, as they were known. Le petit bourgeois, the bourgeois, the middle class, upper middle class, or society of Paris. The lifestyle was changing. People wanted to get out and see their friends, their families, and they wanted to get out and see them in places where they could enjoy each other's company. With these broad streets, broad pavements, because you have to remember, it's the 19th century, so the motor car really isn't a thing. Horses and carts, that's your thing. Motor cars, maybe not. So, all this lifestyle was changing, and... The era we are looking at here has a lot of significant historical change. Previously, you had the uh, aristocrats in France wiped out in the French Revolution. And you had the rise of the people to create a new society. But you also found that you had a new generation of upper and middle class people living a different lifestyle. Lots and lots of changes, lots of conflict, lots of wars, lots of uprisings. Times are difficult, times are changing, contrasting, moving fast, moving fast all the time. So within that time, artists are doing a job. You have to remember what's really important here. <laughs> Pre-cinema, you know, you know, there was no movies. Movies were not a thing until the 
very late 19th century where the Lumiere brothers came out with uh, a film. But we'll come back to that in another program for another time. So, no motor cars, no cinema. What do you have? Just photography, not long invented either. Artists have been doing the work for years of telling stories for people and being paid very well for it. And the stories they tell are on behalf of people like the state, the church, various different, you know, people like that. People who are in charge of all the money. The money, money, money. Now it's funny what money can do, isn't it? So, you know, you have these artists working for the state. Uh, an artist called David who painted for Napoleon III. He made paintings that supported his propaganda that were known as uh, neoclassicist paintings, so these are great grand storytelling paintings, historical paintings, used as a means to create propaganda for people to join Napoleon's armies. After that came to pass, and there was another revolution, there was a movement more politically, or maybe on the left, who knows, uh, where they made realism paintings, so paintings that were about the people, the farmers, the workers of the land, those who got their hands dirty in the ground, the peasants, yeah, those real people behind the revolution. So the realism movement came around and there was a artists like Millet and Courbet who were very big in that movement at the time, yeah. Now Courbet was a very big influence on the man we mentioned earlier on whose name was Manet, Edouard Manet. And Manet was a considered himself to be a realist, and was considered by many to be a realist, but more of a radical realist. He uh, he has sometimes had some work in what was known as the Salon, which was the establishment exhibition at the time, and that work, as beautiful as it was, was not really what he wanted to make work about. He wanted to make work about lifestyle. He wanted to make a realism that tied into his life. And he's one of these bourgeois characters we're talking about. Some people may go against that, some people may agree with that, but he certainly had a lifestyle of money that allowed him to live a slightly more different lifestyle than perhaps realism that portrayed the peasants and the poor people of the country. His first significant move was perhaps considered to be one of the most famous ones, certainly, yeah. It was called Dejeuner sur l'herbe, Dejeuner sur l'herbe, which is known as Picnic in the Park or Lunch in the Park. And it was very, very controversial at the time. Dejeuner sur l'herbe was considered controversial for all manner of reasons at the time, particularly because of the nude ladies in the painting. Up until Recently in art history, naked women had rather been the reserve of goddesses and the Virgin Mary herself. To have naked women in a picture, for particularly naked women in what looked to be a modern context, so in Paris at the time, was controversial in itself. Very controversial. A naked woman gazing out at the viewer in a suggestive fashion. This was not the done thing, but here we are in Paris with a naked lady. What we also see in Manet's work, which is perhaps more obvious here in this self-portrait, is a much, much looser style, a much looser way of delivering aspects of the face, aspects of the character, very quick brushstrokes, rapidly applied to the canvas to capture a moment in time perhaps this was perhaps more significant to uh, those who uh, ended up going on to follow Manet's work the more hardcore impressionist artists known as uh, artists such as Monet as Degas and Renoir these guys these were the people who would be the meat and bones of the impressionist movement and this loose style by Manet I apologize sometimes People do this, they mix money and money up. Don't do that, they're different guys. Different guys, totally different guys. One's called Manny, one's called Money. Both have got beards, but one guy's got a beard who's a lot bigger than other guys. Okay, so Manny and Money, different artists. But Money, Money is the next step in Impressionism, and we'll come to him very shortly. 
we just have one more discussion to make about Manet's paintings and the next painting we're going to look at is a painting called Olympia. We have to watch out though, there's a little bit of nudity in this one too. Okay guys, before we move on to Olympia, let's just have a little look back at Dejeuner sur la Herb and summarize some of the aspects of that painting and why it was significantly different. In Dejeuner, Manet's style changes rapidly away from what realist painting looked like. As I said before, realist painting was more about the working man, about the lifestyle of the working man. It stepped away from the uh, romanticism and the neoclassicism that went before it, which was about, you know, historical paintings being a way to influence people, romanticism being used as a means for political suggestion to people to question what was going on with the state and also for the state to say what was going on for them as well. This step by Manet away from romanticism and realism and his style of realism was looking at what his life was like. What's going on for the guy in Paris? What's going on for him? You know, He uh, chose some models. One was his wife and uh, the other one was a, a, a young lady um, who had uh, various different jobs as well as being a model for Manet and uh, one was his uh, brother and they, they posed in the park and uh, you know did they pose in the park? Was it posed inside? That's the question. It looks very much like it was inside. The proportions are a little bit inaccurate. The brush strokes are quicker. It's not like a traditional style of painting. That's why it was not accepted by the Salon and instead it was placed in the Salon de Refusé. The Refusé was uh, an exhibition set up by Napoleon III for artists whose uh, work was not considered to be acceptable. You know, it was almost a bit of a slap in the face, but a lot of the younger artists use as an opportunity to exhibit their work and get their work out there. You know, it was like, it was for the rebels. It was for those who were going against the grain. Yeah. It was very exciting times in Paris. So now we're going to have a look at Olympia, which, as I said before, has a bit of nudity in it, and it's very controversial. It was considered to be a very erotic piece of art. Not so racy these days, perhaps, no? Yeah. But at the time, very racy indeed. As we can see here, Olympia has no clothes on. This is very controversial for the time because Olympia is a prostitute. That's right, I said it, she's a prostitute. She is a high-end concubine for the middle-class gentleman of the time, the bourgeois, and they would go and pay her a visit and this was considered to be normal for society at the time for gentlemen to go and visit these kind of ladies but it wasn't spoken about publicly it wasn't spoken about publicly it was an unspoken thing and here we have Olympia with her servant lady at her side delivering flowers perhaps from a gentleman caller or something like that and she's staring straight out at the viewer straight out at the viewer that's very controversial because in the past, ladies and gentlemen, this situation would not be the case. A lady, particularly a lady of that type of industry, would not be seen in a piece of art, let alone would she be seen naked. Nudity, as we discussed before, was something that was considered to be purely for goddesses, nymphs, and for the Virgin Mary. To see this in a painting of a normal lady staring out at the viewer in a controversial fashion, a lady looking straight at the viewer like this, was considered to be erotic and therefore very, very rude, and then it caused great upset at the time. Even Dejeuner sur la Herbe, which had been placed in the past, as we discussed in the Salon de Refusé, because the Salon de Refusé had been closed down for nearly 20 years, because of the uh, outrage it caused to Napoleon III and his wife at the time. So when Olympia came along two years later in the salon itself, the outrage was phenomenal. It had to be moved out of the way so people couldn't reach it because they wanted to attack the painting. This is how strong this was at the time. So we have to ask ourselves, why is this important and what's this got to do 
both impressionism, what's it got to do with the times, the changing times in Paris that made impressionism what it is and what we know it to be today? Let's have a discussion about that very shortly. Before we move on from Manet and the adaptation of the Herb and Olympia and uh, Manet's influence on impressionism as a movement, the, the, you know, the, the meat and bones artists we discussed earlier, Monet, Renoir Degas, I want to just have a little look at some of the influences on uh, Manet's work, but her tips, particularly an artist called Tish and also another artist called Goya as well, because as much as his style had, uh, you know, impacted the world, made it very controversial what he was doing, he borrowed a lot from the past. There's a lot of great artists too. They look at other artists and they find influence there, an influence that makes their work their own unique thing, you know, so... Manet was doing it. Let's have a little look at where he may have got the idea. And definitely, we know he got the idea for the uh, composition, composition of the uh, Olympia. Okay, yeah, cool. So once again, here's Olympia, and here is a painting called Venus de Urbino by the artist Titian. The difference, of course, is that in uh, Titian's painting, Venus is a goddess. Olympia is not a goddess. Therein lies the controversy of the work. You can be naked if you're a goddess, but you can't be naked if you're just a naked lady. No simple basic naked ladies allowed. That's the rules. At least that was the rules, certainly back then. Let's just summarise why Manet is considered to be the father of Impressionism, and for some, they say the father of modern art. He changed what people painted, simply. He painted lifestyle as he saw it, he painted his life, his friends, what was going on for him at the time. He was reflecting society through what he painted, how he painted. He was looking at the controversy of how people lived, but also how it was just everyday life. This was something that Impressionist artists did in their bucket loads. They painted everyday life, and he was the first guy to really do that. His brush strokes were quicker. He was not so bothered about capturing all the details very smoothly. It was quick work, quick brush marks, making painting just to give an impression of what he looked like and what a lifestyle looked like at the time. He was a lifestyle painter. This had never happened before. Art previously had all been about politics, had all been about the state, had all been about the church. Now art was stepping into the hands of the everyday man to reflect his everyday life. He was showing the people how he lived, and other artists wanted to do the same. Look as the light comes from my eye, the light's coming from my eye. Ooh. Wow. <laughs> well, of course, we all know that's not actually my eye, yeah. But uh, what we do see from the picture there with the light is all the little bits of light coming off it, as we can see, create a kind of rainbow effect, rainbow. Which brings us back to the Impressionists, of course. Yeah, excuse me, I'll just turn this light off. Brings the power on the phone. <laughs> so yeah, light, yeah. Very important to Impressionist artists. We didn't discuss it a great deal with Manny's work, no, really. He had a lot of black and a lot of white in his work. The next bunch of artists took the idea of reflecting the time and the life quite literally. And Monet is perhaps the master of this. He's the first artist to paint according to how light hits the time of the day and creates how the light looks in the work. You could say he was the first time-based artist. <laughs> time-based artist, yeah. Okay, let's have a look at one of Monet's paintings. The painting that gave the name to Impressionism as a movement. This is Impression Sunrise by Monet. As you can see, it's a sunrise. It's a sun rising over a harbour in the north of France, painted by Monet in the morning as the sun rose. Now, what's interesting about it is, it's very quickly painted. It had to be, because it had to be a painting of the sunrise. 
and the sun doesn't spend as long as you want it to rise, it rises when it's ready to rise, and for as long as it needs to rise. So you've only got a certain amount of time to capture how that looks. And that's the principal idea behind how Monet, Renoir, Degas, and the core Impressionist artists painted significantly. It was about capturing a moment in time and trying to capture that moment in time at the time. Painting outside was something that was new because basically artists hadn't had paint and tubes before this point in time. Putting paint and tubes was not an easy thing to do, but then somebody invented the process of putting paint inside a tube, which allowed the artist to take the paint outside. This was called painting en plein air, or in plein air, in the outside, en plein air. Yeah? And they could go outside and they could paint for the first time outside, capturing what was going on outside on their canvases. They would take their canvases to places where they could paint outside. Moni quite often painted in his rather large garden in France, but he also went to places like this harbour, which I believe may be Le Havre, and he painted it there. And he's painted other scenes outside as well. He painted his friends, his family outside, which is something that another artist who was working at the time, Renoir, famously did in the painting Moulin de Galette, which we're going to have a little look at next. But first, we have to get the fundamentals down here. Painting outside, capturing a moment in time. You only have a short space of time to be able to make the painting. So you've got to try and get the paintbrushes down quickly. Fast brush strokes, getting the colours, working out how the colours stand out from each other. As we look at the colours in this painting, you've got oranges and blues and greens. Colours that contrast with each other. These artists also understood something about science. They understood the rainbow, the light. I was talking about earlier on how light has no black, no black in light, but instead a whole rainbow of colour, a whole range of colours coming through. So they decided that in their palette they should have no black. This was a big bold move to make to create shadows without the darkest colour in the palette. Yeah? Okay. Well, let's have a look at how some of the other guys did it. And we'll start with Renoir's Moulin de Galette, perhaps one of the finest examples, in my opinion, of Impressionism. Hi guys, before we go on to Moulin, Galette, Moulin de Galette, rather I should say, by Renoir, we should reflect momentarily on Monet's work. This painting, Impression Sunrise, it was controversial at the time. People said that these guys couldn't paint. These Impressionist artists couldn't paint. Their exhibition they had together, they weren't called Impressionists before at that point. They were making the new art as they saw it. They were the avant-garde of the art world, which means they were the cutting edge. Art critics came to this exhibition and they saw Impressionist Sunrise by Monet and it was called Impression Sunrise. And... They took the name and they used it mercilessly, mercilessly, I can't speak, my goodness, mercilessly to slate these artists. They called them impersonators, they called them the Impressionists as an insult. But the Impressionist artists did what most smart guys would do. They took that name, they took the name Impressionists and they made it their own. They called themselves the Impressionists. And that's how the name Impressionism came about. That's how the movement was born, as having that name. It was a significant moment in art history. And we still live with the beautiful consequences of that work today. Now we're going to have a look at the work by Renoir. And as I said earlier on, this piece is perhaps one of the finest examples of Impressionist art in history. Oh yeah. Wait till you see this bad boy. Bal de Moulin de la Galette, or in English, Dance at the Moulin de Galette. It's uh, perhaps the masterpiece of, uh, in my opinion, of the uh, Impressionist movement. It captures absolutely everything that was influential on the Impressionist artists. As you can see, there is a dance going on in a park, which is called the Moulin de Galette. And uh, in this dance area, 
you can see light hitting the people in the background and in the midground there's a couple dancing on the left hand side of the painting and the light hits spectacularly off the girl's dress and off the ground surrounding her you can see the light and the shadows through the play of light hitting through the trees above the head there is uh, some light bulbs because uh, gas lighting was being used at the time not gas lighting but gas lighting <laughs> as you see what I did there and in the front in the foreground there's a couple sitting having a chat a couple of ladies there sitting having a chat to one of the gentlemen and a couple of gentlemen guys looking on to see what's going on because they're maybe like thinking oh ladies hello and in the background there to behind them there's a lady leaning against a tree and a gentleman leaning on the tree perhaps trying to say something to the lady on the tree as well and then behind his hat you can see a couple dancing and a young man in a hat getting very close with a lady perhaps trying to give her a peck in the cheek and she's blushingly looking away and it's all very playful and fun isn't it yeah of course this is what we're talking about here with the snapshot of everyday life and culture that's going on in the work yeah that was what was going on with Manet and now we can see this in Renoir's work Monet had a look at the same thing Degas had a look at the same thing the artists of the time were capturing the moments in time and the life of the time in Paris but what's significantly important about this one to me is not only does it capture beautifully well the time and the life of the people having fun and the, the young culture of the time, the working class people, the young middle class people out having a great time in the park, having a party, having a dance, but also the light of the time. That light in that painting is spectacular. It just captures that late uh, afternoon, early midsummer's evening, with the light playing through the trees, hitting and reflecting off the surfaces. But the way the light is handled is exquisite. There's no black in this painting. The painting is made with colours, contrasting colours, jumping out against each other. The idea that the light hits a surface and it creates a shadow, and that shadow is the opposite colour, so those contrasting complementary colours making the shadows jump out. If we look at the slightly pinkish orange colour of the girl's dress, it plays against the bluish green shadow on the ground as well. Everything contrasts and stands out. That's so important, it's vital in Impressionist painting that we understand how contrasting and complementary colors are put together to create that illusion of light and dark against each other. The other aspect as well as the brush strokes. If we look at the painting again, it's not as detailed as some of the paintings from previous generations. It gives us an impression of the moment in time. It's fleeting movement, the movement of the dress. It's not painted as if it's static. It's painted as if it's moving. It's fleeting. It's capturing that fleeting moment in time. It's a perfect impressionist painting. It captures light, it captures colour, it captures a moment in time, it captures a moment in day, it even captures a season, and it captures the lifestyle of the time. To me, Le Bal de la Moulin de Colette is the essence of what impressionist painting is all about. And I hope you can enjoy this painting as much as it gives me pleasure to describe it to you. It's such a beautiful piece of work. If I could have it in my home, I'd probably have to steal it and I'd probably get arrested and that wouldn't be too great for me. And it's rather large, so I probably wouldn't be able to get it under my arm anyway. It's very big. It's in a, the Musée d'Orsay in Paris, which is the home of possibly the finest collection of Impressionist artwork in the world. Yeah, that's right, in the world. It's amazing. And hopefully one day you can go there and visit it yourself and see this painting along with paintings by Manet, Monet, Degas, Renoir, his other works as well. It's such a beautiful place to go. You can even go and see some Pizarro there too. Yeah. Amaze balls. Look at that. Look at that. It's as if by magic as I come to the end of my impressionist art introduction really. Just uh, giving you a brief overview, the light in my picture has changed as well. <laughs> it just shows you, doesn't it? Light is a funny old thing. And those guys, those guys really knew how to capture it. And I hope you saw that in some of the paintings we just had a look at. Lifestyle, light, colour, fast brush strokes, capturing the moment in time, changing art, changing how we look at art, 
taking art and making it not just the tool of the state and of the rich and of the church, but making it the tool of the everyday man to show his lifestyle. Well, I say everyday man, I would say at this point in time it was more that of the bourgeois and the upper middle classes, because not everybody could afford to go to art school back then, <laughs> and maybe still can as well, who knows? But certainly it should not stand in your way nowadays. It didn't stand in mine. That's why I don't have a double barrel second name. Okay guys, now, I hope you've enjoyed today's video. I want you to do one thing for me though. I want you to watch this, but I don't want you to take everything in this for granted. This is about me talking to you about some of the things I know. Some of the facts might not be 100% accurate, but they should be bloody close, I hope. And I'd like you to go and fact check the information yourself. Go and find out about Renoir. Go out and find out about Monet. Find out about Manet. Make sure you know the difference between money and money. It's an O and it's an A, but it's a whole different ball game. I want you to have a look at the realists. I want you to have a look at the impressionists. I want you to have a look at the neoclassicists. And we are going to look soon again in our next video. We're going to look at the post-impressionists because they had a big, big moment in time where they looked at these impressionist guys. They took such great influence from them, but they made their own rules as well. well it's about making your own rules, guys. These guys did it, you should do it as well with your work, but not yet. First you've got to learn about what's been done before, and once you've learned that, you can do your own thing. I hope you've enjoyed the video today, guys. I certainly enjoyed making it, and I love to talk about art history. I could talk about it all day. You can probably gather this from how I speak. Okay, take care, stay safe, stay inside, follow the instructions given to you by the right people. Okay, gonna love you and leave you now, guys. Take care. Catch you later. Bye. Bye.